This is the White House, the home and the office of the President of the United States. Last November, some 70 million American citizens cast secret ballots to determine who would fill this chair, to determine upon whom would fall the responsibilities of this office. The choice was John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the youngest man ever elected. He follows a line which began with George Washington, the first president and the only president elected by unanimous vote. He follows Thomas Jefferson, a principal architect of American democracy. Abraham Lincoln, whose name stands as a symbol of compassion and humanity throughout the world. From their home in nearby Georgetown, on this day, January 20th, 1961, Mr. Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, come to the White House where they are greeted by President Eisenhower. Vice President Nixon, Vice President-elect Johnson and their wives were also guests at the White House. For many weeks, the outgoing and incoming administrations have worked together to ensure the orderly transfer of government. Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Kennedy now ride to the Capitol for the inaugural ceremony, the completion of this transition. Undaunted by the unusually cold weather, the crowds began to gather early in the morning. And here beneath the gleaming dome of the Capitol, honored guests are assembling in order to take their places on the portico. Members of Congress. Former President Harry Truman and family. Poet Robert Frost and Marian Anderson, famed contralto, two of many guests representing the arts in America. Members of the Kennedy family. Justices of the Supreme Court. The Diplomatic Corps, representing countries throughout the world. Mrs. John Fitzgerald Kennedy with her mother. President Dwight Eisenhower and Vice President Richard Nixon. The Vice President-elect, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And the last to take his place, the President-elect. This crowd gathered on the Capitol grounds is about to witness the Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, administer the oath of office. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. In his inaugural address, the president emphasizes that the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. That the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty.
This much we pledge and more. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do. For we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom. And to remember that in the past, those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe, struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. <laughs> to our sister republics, south of our border, we offer a special pledge to convert our good words into good deeds. In a new alliance for progress, to assist free men and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty, but this peaceful revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. To that world assembly of sovereign states, the United Nations, our last best hope in an age where the instruments of war have far outpaced the instruments of peace, we renew our pledge of support to prevent it from becoming merely a forum for invective, to strengthen its shield of the new and the weak, and to enlarge the area in which its writ may run. Finally, to those nations who would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace. Before the dark powers of destruction, unleashed by science, engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. So let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Solemnity gives way to celebration as the traditional inaugural parade begins. 
This year celebrating the birth of a new generation of Americans. A new generation, in President Kennedy's words. Born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace. Proud of its ancient heritage. Arriving at the White House grounds, Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy head for the specially constructed stand, where joined by Vice President and Mrs. Johnson, they will review the inaugural parade. The parade symbolizes the desire of the American people, regardless of party, to wish their new leaders well. Cadets of the United States Military Academy. The Midshipmen of the United States Naval Academy. of the United States Air Force Academy. Floats representing the states in the Union add color and gaiety to the occasion. Massachusetts, home state of President Kennedy and the Republican governor of this state, Texas, home state of Vice President Johnson. This patrol boat is identical to the one commanded by President Kennedy during his service in the Pacific in World War II. And so a nation spends the afternoon of an important day celebrating the inauguration of its 35th president. However, President Kennedy's day is far from over. Early evening brings a display of fireworks.
And later this same evening, citizens from all over the country and the world continue the celebration by dancing at one or another of five inaugural balls. During the ball, the president with the first lady and the vice president and Mrs. Johnson introduces the members of the new cabinet. The secretary of state, Dean Rusk and Mrs. Rusk. The Secretary of the Treasury, Douglas Dillon and Mrs. Dillon. Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara and Mrs. McNamara. Attorney General Robert Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy. And the Ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson and his daughter-in-law are among those presented. The following day at the White House, the Cabinet is sworn in by Chief Justice Warren in the presence of Mr. Kennedy. These men will assist the president in fulfilling the responsibilities of the executive branch of the government. The administration of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy begins. <laughs> 